So let's start. Uh, last time we started talking about the introduction of machine learning, what the problem is, and then started talking about one metric, specifically k-nearest neighbor. And now I'm going to continue doing, uh, talking about KNNs and then move to the next lecture, which is on decision trees. So uh, we had like uh, these, all these basics, so I'm not going through it uh, again with detail, just we have, so we talked about, we focus on supervised learning, And then we talk about training set, which consists of some inputs and corresponding labels or target or output. And there are many different problems of this form. Uh, we discussed several examples. We suggested several examples last time. So uh, we usually talk, uh, convert a problem to an input vector. Uh, so uh, most machine learning methods, or almost like all machine learning methods that we talk about in this course, uh, receives a a vector as its input, because that's a kind of abstract way uh, that we can think about, uh, that we can abstract away the detail of the problem and focus on like the algorithm. So uh, I talked about input vectors, uh, it's just an example how images can be converted to an input, to a vector. And then uh, we talked about uh, different types of problem, for example, regression, where the output is a real vector number and classification, which the output is an element of a discrete set. So uh, you see them a lot, and this is one of the things that you need to know. What's the difference between regression and classification? So uh, we wanted to develop the first algorithm. The question is that, well, given this data set, how can we develop such an algorithm? And we had this idea that maybe just look at the first, the closest uh, neighbor of that query point and whatever label we have for that in the training set, we assign it to uh, the query points as its output. So we need to define a notion of distance. We can talk about Euclidean distance, but we can also define many other distances. Uh, sometimes uh, you have some insight about how uh, the pro uh, how distances should be defined for this particular problem. And if you have that, you can encode it in your uh, distance function. But if you don't have, maybe you can just use something like a Euclidean uh, norm or Euclidean distance. So the algorithm was finding the uh, label of the point that is closest. So we talked about it, uh, that this uh, one nearest neighbor method induces some decision boundaries. And this decision boundary can be in general a complex uh, curve or surface. So this is in two dimensional space. In three dimensional, it would be a surface. And uh, in higher dimensional, it would be kind of more general surfaces, hyper surfaces. But then uh, we discussed that k nearest neighbor is sensitive to, one nearest neighbor is sensitive to noise in uh, mislabeled data. So we move towards uh, having, uh, instead of looking at the k nearest neighbor instead of the of one. So instead of looking only one, we look at the closest tree and do a majority vote. So the algorithm uh, would be like this. Basically, we look at the closest points, find a label that has a majority. So this is for the classification. And then uh, the choice of K induces some uh, notion of, uh, well, the choice of K uh, determines uh, our decision surfaces and decision boundaries. So for example, you, here you see that we have these cases that because we have one blue dot or blue circle there, uh, it determines that this region is blue, but probably that is just a noise in misclassification uh, in mislabeling noise. So uh, maybe we should go with a larger K. And if we do that, we see that we get a generally smoother surface. Okay, I think that was the place that we stopped. Uh, the question now is that uh, how should we 
uh, the trade first, the trade off in choosing K, and also how should we choose uh, K? So usually uh, the idea is that if you choose K, small K, uh, it's good at in capturing fine grain patterns in the data, but it may overfit. So it may be sensitive to uh, random details of the training set, which is not actually reflecting the true pattern in data. On the other hand, if you choose a K to be very large, uh, it makes predictions that are much more stable because it looks at a large neighborhood, but then it may underfit. So it may fail, fail to capture important regularities. Just to give you a kind of extreme example, suppose you have 100 data points and you choose K to be equal to 100. So what would be uh, the prediction of a 100 nearest neighborhood uh, classifier? Okay, so yes, yeah, so the answer was that expected. Mode? Okay, so the, the answer would be the mode. So basically, uh, for all points that you have, uh, it only, for any point that you query, you always give the same answer, which would be the majority vote here. Like if you have, uh, say, if this is your, So if you have this thing and then uh, kind of two classes and then your query point would be here, well, the majority, if you look at K equal to 100 or basically the size of data set, it would be green here too. So, and if the query point is here, it still would be green. So you see that in the extreme case that K is very large, basically we lose capturing any structure in data. So uh, one concept that is important here is the concept of overfitting and underfitting. And we will see it again and again in this course. But the basic idea is that um, we overfit when we are, the output of our algorithm, the predictor is fitting more than necessary. It's fitting to the noise in data essentially. And underfitting means uh, we are fitting to details or fitting, we are not capturing even the main aspects of the pattern. So we will see it more and then it becomes more clear what it means. Okay, so now the question is, uh, so the question is that uh, how should we choose K? So there is a uh, optimal choice of K that depends on the number of data points. And there are some theoretical results showing that how this case can be selected. The general idea is that if, uh, if number of data points goes to infinity, so n goes to infinity, uh, if we choose k also going to infinity, but the ratio of k to n goes to zero, then that type of k nearest neighbor would have nice theoretical properties. So uh, what does it mean? For example, one good rule of thumb is to choose K equal to N to the power of two divided by two plus D. Do you remember what was D? So the answer was the number of dimensions and that's right, yes. So the number of dimensions, if the data is from say, R10, so X belong to this. This rule of thumb says that choose N to the power of 10, 12, 2, 12, over 12. So, uh, but I mean, uh, this is one way, theoretically motivated, but there are better ways or easier ways that uh, we can uh, deal, find good K. Any questions so far? see. Okay. So the idea here is that we want to choose an algorithm that generalizes to data that it hasn't seen before. So this is the whole idea in machine learning. We have a bunch of data points 
uh, we know what is the true answer in, for those data points, but we want uh, the algorithm or the method to be able to predict what happens if uh, we give it a new data point and it should be good chance with prob high probability uh, gives us the say the right label for the classification problem. So what we actually care is uh, how well it generalizes, and then uh, we should talk about how well it generalizes uh, on like a new data point that we see. So uh, so we have this com concept that is called generalization error, which is basically uh, the idea that if uh, you, you have your machine learning algorithm, whatever it is, and then you run, uh, you train it, and now you give a new data point. What is the chance of error that it may have? What's the probability of error? So that error is called generalization. So this is different from error uh, that the algorithm may have on the data point that is used for training. So this is an error on the new uh, data point. And I'm going to talk about it uh, uh, a bit more, uh, but here we measure usually the generalization error on something that is called test set. But I get back to that soon. So if you measure it, uh, we get some uh, results like this, that uh, basically uh, here, the x-axis, is the k, the number of nearest neighbor that we have. So this is one nearest neighbor. This is the large 151 nearest neighbor. And now uh, what we do is that we uh, first show the training data and compute the error on the training data. And you see that the error follows this kind of curve. So on the left, when k is equal to one or a small number, this is a very small value. And uh, when k is large, this is a large value. But then we have another curve here, which is this uh, test error, which is shown by orange, uh, that is basically showing that what would be the error if we have a new data set independent from the previous data set and compute the performance, the error on that. So a few questions, uh, why, so when k is equal to one, like this point, the error is actually zero. Why is that? Is there a problem with the model? Okay, so the answer is that because we are fitting to the model. Uh, and that's true. Uh, can you explain a bit more why we are fitting or what happens uh, when we compute the, we use KNN, uh, it put K equal to one and compute the error on the training set. Nearest neighbor of it is itself. Okay, so exactly. So the answer is that the nearest point is itself. Uh, yeah, so I guess here they also uh, all belong to this, to that only K or exactly the same with the training set. So I think that would be the same uh, answer. So basically, uh, if k equal to one, the nearest point of each training point is this itself. So uh, we know what is the performer, what is the true label there. So there is no mistake there. But as we increase the, uh, as we increase k, uh, we see that we make more, more and more error. And on the other, the left side here. Uh, the performance would be very bad because that would be similar to this situation that I had here. That if K is like 100, we have 100 data points, we always just choose the majority. Is this clear? Okay. So, uh, but then uh, on the other hand, we have a kind of a different behavior in the test set. So uh, here we see that uh, when k is actually small, one, it's not the best performance. First of all, it is not the, the error is not zero anymore, which makes sense because we are not looking at the training set that we use for training of the 
algorithm, but we are using a new point that is selected independently. And then uh, which, when we increase K, we see that there is this region, say, that has the best performance. And then, uh, but as we increase K again, uh, we see that the performance degrades. So there is an optimum point, which is in between the maximum possible K and minimum possible K, that is the best choice for generalization or for the test. Okay, uh, so question. So I guess the question is, should we try raising our hand when asking a question or just type or if, is there uh, no preference? I mean, you can try to raise your hand. The problem is that I don't, may not notice it. Uh, I think if you want to talk, raise your hand, but uh, typing is safest because I will see for sure. Uh, but let's try it. Uh, raise your hand and talk and then see how, what happens. Okay. Uh, so now we have a kind of important concept that we will see uh, many times in uh, machine learning in this course, which is called the concept of training, validation, and test sets. So uh, we, we already seen training set and we mentioned test set. Training set was the data point, data set that we use for training our algorithm. So that's a training part, names comes with. Test set is the data set that we want to uh, uh, compute the generalization. So if you want to say uh, how this algorithm after being trained perform in real world, we use test set for reporting that. But validation set is actually something uh, that is used for another purpose. And the purpose is to choose parameters of the algorithm or hyperparameters of the algorithm. In this case, how to choose K. So uh, how does it work? Uh, the way that we work is that, uh, okay, K, first of all, is an example of a hyperparameter of a network of this uh, KNN. If when later we talk about neural network, uh, if you're familiar or heard about them, the number of layers or the number of units in a neural network would be its hyperparameters. And we will see that almost all machine learning algorithms have some hyperparameters. And as you saw just in the previous slide, uh, depending on your choice of hyperparameter, you get different uh, performance on test data sets. So how should we tune them? We tune them using validation sets. So the way that usually work as a kind of pipeline is that I give you, uh, like you, you want to solve a new problem. Uh, you collected or someone collected say thousand data points for you. So you have thousand data points and then someone asks you to uh, basically train an algorithm and tune its hyperparameters so that when you give me this algorithm and I use it in the wild, the performance would be as uh, good as possible. And also tell me what that performance would be. So um, the assumption here is that uh, the data set that is given to you is similar to the, in distribution of the data set, it would be similar to the distribution of data points that you see in the wild. So we, we make this assumption in most of this course. So uh, basically we say that the distribution of everything is the same. So distribution of uh, training set and distribution of testing set would be the same. Okay, I think it becomes more clear. Yes, question. So the really just the test set that we use specifically for the purpose of doing the model. Uh, so the question is whether we use, so what's the question that whether we use test sets to tune the hyperparameters? It's a, it's a test set that you only use for the purpose of uh, adjusting the hyperparameters. So it would be a test set so, uh, that is used for adjusting the hyperparameters. The, val the validation set yeah. plays that role exactly. Yeah. It's a kind of imitates the test set, but we use it for uh, just adjusting the hyperparameter. So the way it works, yeah. So for example, 
uh, we get 1,000 data points. We divide it to three uh, sets. For example, I don't know, 600, then maybe 100 or 200 and 200, right? So you divide it like this. And then you give this 600 to your algorithm. So for example, if it's K nearest neighborhood, uh, you give it to K equal to one, and then you try with different parameters, K equal to three, uh, 10, whatever range that you want to try. And then of course uh, you're, you get a training set, tra error on the training set, but that is not really meaningful uh, because of this thing that we have in this case, like k equal to one, the training set is always zero. But we can use uh, the validation set to measure the performance of this algorithm uh, for different choice of hyperparameters. Like k equal to one, the performance would be like, error would be 7.3. Let's say for a second, this is a classification error. So 7.3%, there's a classification error. Uh, if we choose it equal to uh, three, it would be 1.1. Another value, it would be 10.5. So this basically says that when we choose k equal to one, sorry, equal to three, this gives us the best performance on the validation set. So because the distribution of validation set and test set and training set, all these three are the same, we can infer that if we want, if we compute this parameter, uh, if we choose this parameter, hyperparameter, uh, the performance would be uh, this amount. And then if it transfer this algorithm to the test situation, the performance would be also uh, around what we estimated using validations. Uh, yes. Uh, there are some questions. Oh, sure. Okay, good. Okay, so so why can't, okay, so one question, why can't we use training set to measure the generalization performance. What's the point of having another test data set? So the reason is that uh, like as we have here, in this case of KNN with K equal to one, the training set, error on training set is zero, with K equal to one. But that is not actually uh, measuring the performance of algorithm on a new data set. I'm going to talk a little bit about more justification about that. Oh, yes. It sounds to me like the face would just a head against what was there. That's kind of the way that I'm. The validation set or test set? Oh, really? So the answer was that it's a hedge over for overfitting. Uh, well, we, we use both validation and test set to measure uh, the performance on a data set that is independent from the data set used for training. Right. And test set allows us to uh, validations. Basically test set would be kind of final report. We don't tune anything based on tests. Validation set would be some data set that is independent from training set. So we can use it to tune the parameter and it would act as I think you mentioned, it says, another test set before our final test set. So that gives kind of a per measure of our performance. I give you a bit more, I mean, I guess mathematically we can talk about it a little more, more and I have a one slide on that, that may make it more clear. Let me go through some of these. Uh, in the case of, let, let me just go through this few of these, there are several. In the case of KNN, isn't the validation doing the same thing as the training set? Uh, they're both trying to find the optimal value of K. Am I right? Uh, not completely, because for training set, we don't choose, uh, we don't use the performance. To choose K, say to choose K, uh, we don't use trainings, we just use validations. So, uh, and the performance, say, just think about K equal to one. The performance of K equal, train, K equal, to, equal to one on training sets would be, just the error would be zero. So we can, that would be our best choice. We have to go to a new data set, which is independent from previous data set to choose the best K. Uh, 
So I think we use the validation set to test the performance of the optimized K from the training uh, set. Uh, so we use validation set to find the best K. We, opt, we use validation set to optimize the hyperparameter. Um, okay. So I guess there are some answers. Okay, so the... So this is a part of the training data where you know the label. So you know, well, in for all these cases, for this whole data set, you know the label, both input and output. But this is just a way, like 8,000 data points, we divide it to three parts, and then uh, you use one part to measure the, uh, you train your algorithm, that's the training set, use validation set to find the hyperparameter of your algorithm and test set to report the final result. Okay, so I think, so should the distribution of the validation set be different from the training set? No, here I guess we assume that the distribution of all of them are the same. So they are coming from the same probably, probably distribution. Okay, uh, was there a question here? Yes. So, but since the data from validation set is randomly selected from the training set, uh, what if like, like if we have great amount of data, k is three is better than k is four, but with our small validation set, uh, we discover that k equals four is greater than, like the error of k equals four is uh, smaller than k equals three. So we, uh, we have a risk that we choose the right thing. So I'm not sure if I completely understood. So you're saying that with different choice of validation set, you may get different uh, case. That is the best case. Uh, I mean, if we have like an uh, infinite amount of data right. for the branches, the error of k equal to three is smaller than uh, k equal to four. Right. But since we are randomly selecting a small subset of- Ah, okay. Data, okay. We, we got inverse result. So, okay, if I, if I understand your- Question. So basically, as soon as we have a lot of data points, then uh, the best parameter maybe should be k, k equal to four. But then when we select a smaller number, maybe the best k would be equal to three or another number. Yeah, maybe we could not unlock with like imbalanced data. So let's, I mean, there's an issue of imbalance. So uh, the other comment was that, uh, maybe we have imbalanced data, right? So maybe just answer the first part. So uh, this is, a, I think, actually a good point. Uh, what happens is that uh, maybe going back to this optimal K. So this is from theory that says that the optimal K should be selected to n number of data points to the power of something which depends on dimension. Uh, so if you have 100 data points, if n equal to 100, there would be one result. So the K optimal would be something, if you choose 10,000, the, the best choice would be different in general. And if this is of course the total, total result, but even if you do it with your, uh, this scheme of having validation training set, validation set, uh, if you change your validation set or training set to uh, be 100, the results, and then use a validation set to compute the performance, the best choice of hyperparameter, the results would be different uh, when compared to the case that you have a larger training set. So what happens here is that uh, you have a thousand data point, but actually you only use 600 of them uh, for cell training. Uh, but what if, for example, you choose uh, some other number? say 700, and then you chose 200 and 100. So because 700 and 600 are two different numbers, the optimal choice of K for them would be also uh, slightly different. And that would be an issue because effectively you reduce the size of your training set, which reduces the performance of your algorithm slightly. So that would be an issue. So uh, there are methods. So the idea is here is that uh, we need to make sure that uh, 
our training set is not becoming too small compared to the whole data set that we have. So for example, if we selected the date training set to be only say 50 data points within the thousand data point, that would not be a good, uh, good use of our data. There are methods that try to make this more efficient and uh, trying to make the size of the validation set and test set, like this portion of the data, which is currently using 400 data points, as small as possible. So we just accept the fact that we may not select the best case if we're So the, uh, the question or the comment was that uh, we accept the fact that we may not select the best case, and that's true. So we don't select the best case for 1,000 data points. Mm -hmm. We select the best K for 600 data in this case. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is that these, these hyperparameter changes usually slowly. Like if your data point, you have 600 data points and you make it 700, your K would not be very different. Yes. That's funny that the assumption that all the factors set are all the same to Yes, so uh, that's right. So the question was, so the question is, uh, was, or well, the comment was that uh, that's why we have the assumption that all the sets have the same distribution. And that's, that's true. Yeah, that's, uh, if we want to talk a little more mathematically, your computing performance with respect to, uh, your optimizing performance with respect to uh, training set distribution. Uh, it only entails that if we transfer it to a uh, same distribution, we can say something about it. If the distributions are, very, are slightly different, that's okay. But if they are very different, then we cannot really say much. Maybe actually I just give you an example. Um, okay, so I use another. So. So we have two colors. So our training set is this region or all data set, like uh, suppose all tra our training set is coming from here. But then uh, we have a question, someone queries, what is the performance at that point, the red point? We cannot really say much about that because we haven't had any example from that point. So this is the case that uh, the distribution of tests, so you're testing at this red point, is very different from the distribution from in our training set, which was here. So for example, if our test set is always asking about here, far from the regions that we have data for training, uh, we cannot say anything meaningful. And there is active research how to deal with this situation. Okay, so uh, let me see. A lot of question. Okay, so are there any hyperparameters in the KNM model apart from K? No, not the way that I described. I mean, if you choose, you can also think about the uh, distance function and you can change it hyperparameterize your distance function. But here I talked about assuming the distance function is fixed, so it's not hyperparameterized. If the distribution of all sets are the same, then how would we know that the network generalizes proper to random cases? So random cases, here I guess the assumption is that random comes from the same distribution that we use for training, validation, and tests. Uh, because also random, I mean, random basic random point means that uh, come a, a data point that comes from some distribution. Uh, and the question is that what is that distribution? And if the same distribution, then we are doing fine. Uh, but as I kind of have it here, if the distributions are different, machine learning algorithms may not perform well, but also humans may not perform well. Uh, so if they, you, someone takes you to a new, uh, okay, maybe give an example. Uh, so if you know, say, uh, 
English, French, Chinese, or anything. And then, so this is the sentence that the sentences that you hear are coming from a distribution of English languages. The sound comes from there, or Chinese or French. But if they take you to, uh, say, Persian, uh, probably most of you may not understand. It is still language, uh, but the distribution is just coming from another region. Uh, so how can you do it? Uh, I mean, there are research and people can learn faster if they know several languages. Uh, you can learn a new language much faster because uh, you are able to transfer your knowledge, how grammar works to a new language and learn faster. Uh, but then uh, still we need some learning. It would be the same, like uh, this case that I have, here is kind of like that example, that extreme example. Okay. Okay. I guess there's a, I try to skip things that don't have a question mark at the end. There are many of them. Is there a way to determine the best training sample size? Uh, so there are some heuristics, how to split the training uh, validation and test set. And there are of course some theoretical results that can say what are uh, they, uh, what should be the kind of optimal choice. Uh, but usually you have, I mean, depending on how much data you have, but uh, most of it would be on training sets, the 80% of it on training set, 10% on validation, 10% on test. But that 80% can become 70% uh, or a little bit higher. So here the example 600, it's usually, I guess, smaller than the usual suggestions or heuristics. Okay, I guess that's also answered the next question. So the question is for k equal to one, why would error be 7.3 on the validation set? Shouldn't it be zero because all points are classified to be single, that single k. Uh, just remember that validation set, uh, when you run KN, then KN finds the closest point in the training set. So only uses the points, uh, finds, computes the distance to points in the, uh, through the training set. So if the point is from class validation set, uh, that point probably is not within the uh, training set. Okay, so there is a discussion about the high dimensional data. Okay, so. Okay, I think, okay. Okay, so I guess the other question. Uh, yeah, I guess I answered kind of, the heuristic how to choose between size of choose the training validation and test set. And there are some kind of, you can talk about some theory about it, but usually it would be, like 70, 80% would be training set, uh, and then the other would be split between them. Uh, and yeah, okay. Maybe I shall move on. Okay, so this might actually be a better slide to have first, but I didn't want to have a, uh, oops, change the flow of talking about KNN and machine learning algorithm, but this may give you a little bit more intuition or a different perspective of talking about validation set, training set and validations. Okay, suppose that, okay, so let's forget about KNN. Suppose we are given a real valued random variables, x1 to xn, all from the same distribution. So we have x1 to xn. Here, uh, I use a superscript to denote the number of the data point, but I guess also it is very common, more even more common to use subscript. So I use different notation. So you see different ways that people uh, refer to these things. So all of them coming from some distribution, mu. And then we want, we would like to compute the expectation of this random variable x. 
So we want to see expectation of that random variable X when X coming from distribution. Uh, so how do we compute this expectation or estimate this M uh, using this N data points? Take the average, so our answer is take average. So basically we say that MN, you define the estimator to be a summation of N data points, right? And then we have results that, like because of law of large numbers, that MN converges to the true value when N goes to infinity. So we have this type of results. Uh, now suppose N, now suppose N is, uh, okay, maybe the better question is that, uh, how do we want to, how can we measure the quality of our estimate? But maybe before that, let me uh, just focus on the, another case that, Suppose n equal to one. So our estimate, which we call it m hat, would be essentially x1, right? So we have one data point, the average of one data point is that only data. So how close is this m? What's the difference between m and m? Zero. And so the answer was that what zero, but not really, right? Because it's, 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 right. So it's well, no, this is a okay. So I guess the answer is that it depends on the sample size and the distribution of trying to kind of summarize what you said. Uh, but M is the true expectation. So there is nothing random about M. So it doesn't depend on date. It depends on distribution mean, but doesn't depend on uh, data and data points that we collected. So this is, uh, we can say something like this. Okay, so this is essentially, maybe I just write it X1, right? And this is from M. Let's talk about its squared value and compute its expectation. So this expectation would be what? It would be its variance. Now, suppose we want to, so variance would be estimate the quality of our, uh, says that if you have one sample in expectation, how much error we have from uh, the true value of the mean of that random value. And if we have say more data points, so if instead of Xn, I would use say M hat of N minus M, then I would have a better performance. So it would be something like N. Uh, but I don't know M, so I can't really compute it. So suppose one idea is that, uh, let's call this training set. And then you say that I want to estimate what is my test error would be. And test error would be, uh, I define test error as, okay, as generalization error maybe. I define it as, maybe I erase this part. I kind of want to have a comp estimate of this value. So I want to know how far I am from the, the same distribution. Now, uh, one suggestion was that, okay, use the same training set in order to compute it. So same training set basically says that compute the distance of your estimate n hat with the data from the same distribution, the from same training set that you have. So what is that data? X1 again. 
So you have x1, and then you compute it with x1. And then you have this value as your estimate of your f, but this is zero. So this does not give you any reasonable estimate of how much your single sample estimate of your mean would be different from the true mean. So this is very similar to the situation of KNN with K equal to one. So if K equal to one, uh, the hair, in that case, the classification error on the training set would be zero. Here also we would have error that is uh, zero. What, what else could you do? So another suggestion is that, okay, I give you two data points. Uh, so maybe I write it here. I have X1 and X2. I divide X1 and X2 to two data points. Both of them are from the same distribution, of course. I call X1 training and X2 test. My estimate M hat would be just X1, but when I want to compute it with uh, the error, I compare it with uh, the distance with X2. And that would be an estimate of my error. So in this case, this error would not, this difference would not likely to be zero. So it gives a kind of estimate of the variance that I have. Of course, if you have only two data points, your estimate would be very inaccurate. But uh, here, I guess what I want to emphasize is that by this separation of the, what we use for training, which is estimation of F hat, and what we use for testing, we get accurate estimate of the quantity that we care about, which for example, in this case, would be the variance of our estimate. The detail, I'm skipping the detail, so I'm not writing things uh, completely, but this is kind of intuition from not a machine learning problem, but just estimation of a mean of random value. So, okay. Maybe I should move forward a little bit uh, faster. Uh, so, Okay, so another issue that is important to know, uh, another concept that is important to know in machine learning is called the curse of dimensionality. Uh, the curse of dimensionality basically says that problems uh, become hard when we go, the data points are from high dimensional uh, input spaces. So uh, the kind of idea here is that, uh, so for example, in KNN, uh, what we are doing is that uh, we are looking at the closest point uh, to in order to predict or take closest point in order to predict uh, the performance of our, uh, in order to predict say the label. The, the issue is that in high dimensions label data points uh, would become kind of far from each other. So maybe, a better way of kind of visualization would be like this. Suppose, again, we have a two-dimensional data. So X. And I have some other data points. So if I have a query point here, I can kind of expect to have a good performance or good prediction when there are some other points in my neighborhood that are close enough to my point. So if I can uh, kind of guarantee, have this kind of guarantee that the data points that are, uh, there are some data points, enough data points in say epsilon neighborhood of my uh, query points, then Assuming that the underlying function or the classifier that I want to learn is has some kind of nice smoothness property, so it's not changing abruptly, then I can uh, benefit from this 
uh, being epsilon close to my current point in order to be able to provide a reliable prediction. So uh, is this clear what I said? Okay, so let's just see how many regions. Okay, so if you want to uh, have this epsilon resolution, so kind of what I want is that there's a query point and then I want to have a point, a points that are kind of epsilon around me and I want epsilon to be kind of small. So uh, one way to think about it is that let's just see how many regions with the size of epsilon we have in this uh, two dimensional space. So I'm dividing it to regions with the size of epsilon. Suppose this is between zero and one and zero and one and this is all these are epsilon. So how many regions do I have here? As a function of epsilon, not actually what I do. Okay, yes, so there is an answer one over epsilon squared, right? So uh, the number of each side is divided to uh, one over epsilon parts. And then I have two dimensions. So I get one over epsilon squared. So this is assuming that the range is between zero and one, but for any bounded region, it would be the same. So it would be the order of one over epsilon squared. So if I want to have the guarantee that uh, for any point, that query point that I have, say, this is a query point, there would be a point that is epsilon close to me. How many data points do I need? Order of data points. And suppose the data points are uniformly distributed in the whole region. So they are not all concentrated in some subspace of it, but, or subset of it, but just all over it. Would it be, okay, so would it, yes? Just the number Roughly so the answer is that not roughly the number of regions, and that's correct. Like if we, uh, right, yes, but I mean roughly one over epsilon squared. The number of regions would be a good approximation of the number of data points that I need to have in order to cover it. So uh, if I have any point, any number of points less than that there would be some regions that are empty. Like if, yeah, essentially anything smaller than one over epsilon squared, uh, then there would be points that is a region that would be empty, which entails that if I have my query point is in that region, then uh, no point in the training set is closer than epsilon two. So this is kind of like rough heuristic arguments that we need to have at least uh, one over epsilon squared number of data. So what happens if we have the dimension of data is not uh, two, but is dimension D. So I think you would agree based on the same reason or reasoning is that, okay. We need one over epsilon squared number of, sorry, epsilon to the power of D uh, number of data points in order to ensure that for any query point, I'm, there is a point, point in a training set that is epsilon close to me. Okay, so yes, there are the correct answer in the chat too, that's great. Um, so let's just choose epsilon to be Okay, so what is the dimension of an image? Okay, so that's great. So what is your camera's resolution? It's like 10, 20 megapixel. 
So it would be dimension is order of millions, 10, 20 millions. So if epsilon is equal to 0.1, like you just want to have a point that is 0.1 close to your point, then you get something like 10 million. So, okay. I guess that would be the number of data points you require in order to cover that space uh, with epsilon equal to point 0.1 resolution. So how large is this number? This is huge. Like, so this is huge. I guess this is more than number of atoms in the world or anything like that. I guess I can't remember what was, what's the most recent estimate, but I think it's like 10 to the power of 80 or 90 is the number of atoms in the universe. So this is much, much, much more than that. So basically means that if you want to use a method like KNN with a data point that is high dimensional, uh, you can't do much, at least based on these analyses. And this is called the curse of dimensionality. This basically says that learning in high dimension is going to be very difficult. Like even dimension equal to 10, it becomes already difficult. Okay. Uh, so there's a question, what are the units of epsilon equal to one? It's pixels. Uh, no, it is like uh, the distance in pixel values. So if, so for example, if you normalize the pixels, the value, the colors between zero and one, uh, that epsilon means that there would be a pixel that uh, the color is 10% different at most from your query point. Okay, so this is, this is, uh, yeah, basically, I guess this is kind of argument I, uh, that we have, if we have dimension, high dimensional problem, the, num the number of uh, regions would increase very fast uh, with dimension, exponential in dimension, and then the problem of learning would become more difficult. So I skip this, well, I mean, this is basically I mentioned, and you actually see this in your homework, that uh, in high dimension, most points, if you choose them randomly, are essentially the same distance from each other. Uh, this is very, this is not intuitive because this is not the case in uh, two dimension. Like if I, say in this region, if I uniformly randomly choose uh, some points and select two of them randomly, like this point and this point, and then choose another two pairs randomly, the distribution of these distances are very different. But if you go in high dimension, what happens is that uh, most of these points actually, if you select them randomly, uh, would be uh, almost the same distance. So in high dimension, everyone is far from each other, which is not intuitive. Uh, but some, yeah, I guess there, is, there are some, we can prove it. And I think uh, in your homework, probably we try to prove it. So um, I okay. So I think this there is no class after this. How much longer can you stay after this class, or do you have to immediately leave at one? It's okay to leave, stay a bit more. Okay. At most ten fifteen minutes. Okay, so. Okay, that's good. So I, I try to record it, try to finish it 15 minutes after, see how far we can go. Maybe we can have actually a few minutes break. This is 10 past 12. Let's start in three, four minutes past 12. Just a quick, very quick break. And then we can. Okay. So there is a question that if about the distance between pictures. Uh, so uh, just think about this image that. Uh, this is five by five or four by four image. Uh, 
uh, and it is converted to uh, a more 16 essentially dimensional pixel. So that would be the same idea. Uh, that's how we compute the distances, the dimensions of in pixels or images. Okay, so. Uh, So curse of dimension, it doesn't seem to be very good news, uh, but we see that when we apply machine learning algorithms, actually they don't perform too bad on um, many of the input data points that we use, including images. Like for sure, neural networks perform very well on many types of images. And even if you use K nearest neighborhood on images, they would perform reasonably well. So nothing like, 10 to the power of uh, 10 million number of data points that we require. We can get good performance with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of images. So why is that the case? Uh, so the reason is that uh, many of the data points that we have, we use in practice in real world, uh, have actually some intrinsic dimension in, uh, which is different from the, their apparent dimension. So the actual dimension of it is uh, much lower than uh, the dim their apparent dimension. So what does it mean? So here, uh, I'm just showing you a two-dimensional example. So this is like X1 and X2. And, but you see that data points are like following this curve. And this curve is essentially uh, a one dimensional uh, subset of this two dimensional space. So this is called manifold. So this is like data is on low one dimensional manifold, which is embedded in two dimensional space. So this is, this kind of shows that the effective dimension of data points, these data points are actually one and not two. And this happens for many, like the difference between one and two is not huge, but in many cases, uh, maybe the effective dimension, uh, the apparent dimension is order of hundreds or thousands, but the effective dimension is just five, six, ten. So much, much smaller. Uh, so why? I mean, we can. I have this example that why it happens, but I guess it's usually difficult to kind of convey. Uh, suppose you have an, a camera. So how many degrees of? So this camera is looking at say a, a room. So this camera can uh, rotate in this direction, for example, and in this direction. So there are two uh, dimensions that the images can change or dim two dimensions that the camera's viewpoint can change. And the effect of it would be that the vectors, like this vector that we see as an image, when I turn this would be a transformed version of the previous vector. So there would be a transformation that uh, transfers pix uh, pixel one or image one to image two based on the angle that I see. Imagine that this camera sees all the uh, pixels. So none, none, of the pix camera, none of the pixels gets out of the range of the viewpoint of the camera. So what this basically means is that uh, any data point that I generate by just rotating in this direction would be related to the previous one just by a transformation that is uh, parameterized by one dimension. The result is that if I draw something like this manifold here, it looks like similar thing, except that uh, the manifold would be in the embedded in a dimension that is the in dimension of the pixel uh, of the image. So hundreds or thousands of uh, a vector space with a dimension of thousands. So this basic shows that, uh, this shows that one procedure that we have this kind of uh, low dimensional structure appearing in the data because the way that data is constructed. So this is the intuition that, uh, so there are these regularities of structure in the input that a machine learning algorithm might be able to benefit from or exploit and get somehow avoid the curse of dimensionality. 
of course, there's a question that say, for example, whether K nearest neighborhood can benefit from this type of structure and data point or not. And this, I mean, this is not obvious, but it can be proven that yes, it can. So the dimension that the behavior uh, determines the behavior of K nearest neighbor depends on the intrinsic dimension of data and not the ambient dimension or uh, the apparent dimension of data points. So this is mostly just a comment. Okay, so the, I want to talk about some kind of other aspects of near uh, KNNs. So uh, nearest neighbors be, can be sensitive to the, ra uh, the range of different features. Uh, so for example, why? Because it's Euclidean distance. So if you stretch one dimension in one way by uh, order of by, say, 10 times, uh, the order of distances would be So this becomes something happens here. Okay. So the order of distances would be different. So I guess just an kind of example here is that uh, suppose the data has two dimension. One of them is time, minute, the other is inch. So the data points are uh, kind of clustered in this way. But then if I convert it minutes to seconds and inch to feet, that would be a totally different scaling. These are again the same data points, but uh, they are stretched in different ways. And then the nearest neighbor for any point would be different depending on whether I use this scaling or this scale. So this shows that K nearest neighborhood would be uh, kind of sensitive to a range of different features. There's one fix is that to normalize all data points, to be, for example, zero mean and unit variance. So this is kind of like processing that we can do on data before doing any machine learning on it. And instead use, say, X tilde J uh, for dimension J, use X tilde for each data point, which is normalized in this way. But sometimes the scale might be actually important in the problem. And this would be part of, say, some machine learning engineer, or if, as a uh, machine learning scientist, you want to solve a problem, then you have to figure out whether this scale is important or not, or how to uh, basically uh, normalize different dimensions. Okay, so another comment is about the com computational cost. The computational, the training cost, the uh, computational cost at the train time is zero, because there is an actual, there's no training, you just store the data. But at the test time, you have to uh, compute the uh, closest points to your query point. So uh, we need to compute the dimensional Euclidean distance with n data points, like all the n data points that you have in the space. So computation of that is order of n times d. And then you have to sort them, find the k nearest one. And then for sorting them, you have n distances to sort them, uh, you have n log n computation time. And this, is, this should be done for any query point. So this can be kind of expensive, uh, for example, if n is very large, like if n is a million, uh, you have this type of computation time, which is order of million uh, or million log n, million uh, at each query point, which can be slow. Uh, but then uh, there is a lot of work how to make um, K nearest neighborhood computationally much more efficient by using kind of better data structures uh, that store data in a way that we don't need to do this kind of sorting at every time. Uh, I mean, we don't talk about them, uh, but there is a big literature that if you want to uh, look at. Okay, so I think. Okay, so these are some kind of examples of how it performs. So there is this. Uh, so what I want to kind of mention here without going into detail is that we have this data set called MNIST, which is digits data set, which essentially looks like this. So the digits from zero to nine. Uh, there are 
dimension pixels, it's 28 by 20 pixels. So it's 784 uh, dimensional objects are grayscale, no color. So for training set samples, uh, six, 60,000 samples you have. And maybe if uh, you need to kind of possibly divide it to training and validation. So that 60,000 is the amount that you have to uh, use for tuning your algorithm and training your algorithm. And there's 10,000 that is for test samples. So when you want to report your result and compare it with others, that 10,000 should not be used uh, in any fine tuning of your algorithm. So 60,000 and nearest neighborhood actually performs reasonably well. So for example, if you use a K nearest neighborhood with Euclidean distance, uh, you get 5% accuracy, which is okay. Like uh, not great, but it is a reasonable performance. But then uh, there are other methods, other variants of uh, K nearest that gets performance uh, much better 2% or even less than 1%. And these are based on better base, better distance measures. Instead of Euclidean, uh, they define very different ways of distances. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, then we have to say, for example, uh, support vector machines that we are going to talk about, and they get a performance of 1.1. .1. Uh, we can have simple neural networks and they get uh, like 4.7% per, uh, percent of test error. And then there are kind of more advanced algorithms that get less than 1%. Uh, what more advanced neural networks that get better performance. So uh, you see that uh, KNNs perform reasonably well. If you have a better, if you use a better distance function, it performs even better. Okay, so I think there's discussion ongoing there. Okay, so uh, I am going to skip these things. Uh, you can look at them. These are just some applications of how KNN may work. Uh, just kind of to conclude this part. So we talk about some simple algorithm that all does all the work at the test time. So in a sense, there is no learning. So there's no training phase. It can be used as a regression too, uh, which uh, basically instead of doing majority vote, uh, we compute the average value of the targets for the query points. The com complexity of the algorithm is controlled by hyperparameter K, which is looking at the K nearest name. And it suffers from curse of dimensionality. Uh, though I had this comment that if the data structure, if the data has some intrinsic structure, uh, that kind of mitigates the curse of dimensionality to some extent. The other, the issue with it is that it is not very explainable. So you can't really explain how KNN decided to do that. You can just basically say that it looked at the five nearest one and four of them was apple, one of them was orange, so that is it. Uh, that was its decision. But you can't say why, what aspect of being orange or apple was important for it. So uh, next time, which is actually starting in a minute, we've, I'm going to talk about uh, decision trees. It's another method for uh, kind of doing classification and regression. Is there any question? <laughs>